I mean, if God is gone, how do you get him back? I mean, maybe you have at times felt distant or you just feel there's some sort of disconnect and God feels far away or you feel like he has been silent and has seemingly left the building altogether. Well, how would you go about getting him back? I mean, it's a crass way to say it. Obviously, God hasn't gone anywhere, but I think we understand what what I mean when I say it. I want to see in our text this morning just how we go about that. And in the first four verses, I want us to see a call to repentance, a call to repentance. You remember last week, we saw the ark return to Israel, which seemed like good news, but instead of it being a day of joy, it quickly turned into a pretty long day of mourning when 70 died for their failure to take God's holiness seriously. And because of that, you'll notice in our text, Israel is rightly afraid. They don't want to be around God. (laughs) He is far too frightening as far as they are concerned. You'll remember last week the text ended with this question, who can stand before a holy God? And that very question, you know, echoes through the valley of our text and really comes to us from the background, who can stand before a holy God? It's Israel's question because they don't want to be anywhere near him, so they ship him off to kiriath Jerim, where we find that God basically lives in storage away from his people for 20 years. You know, 20 years, there is no contact between the people of God and the ark of God. And it's as if functionally, anyway, God is dead. It's really clear that the covenant relationship, anyway, is in serious disrepair, and it seems like something pretty dramatic has to happen, or our story of the nation is pretty much over. Uh, It seems that people can't, you know, if you will, live with God, uh, at least the people of Israel. And so once you ship God off, you'll notice that the people then find that they have to create gods of their own to kind of just manage throughout any given day. We learn for uh, that for after some time, uh, Israel is now mourning the loss of God, much like they were formerly lamenting the loss of their fellow, fellow countrymen who fell before the ark. And it's here that Samuel enters our text to speak to the nation. So the ark's been gone, the people are lamenting the fact that God, if you will, isn't with them. And so Samuel comes and approaches them and says, look, if you want to remedy this, here's the solution. If you are returning to the Lord, then put away the foreign gods that are among you, and he will deliver you from the hands of the Philistines. I mean, so... Clearly, while God was off in storage, the Israelites had concerns about, you know, how they would live. How would their garden grow? They live in a land where there's no irrigation. Their dependence is wholly upon the weather and especially upon rain. And if there's not rainy seasons, if there's not uh, fertility for the ground and in their lives, they'll be in jeopardy. And there's also this reality that they're surrounded by enemies. And if there's not a God to protect them from enemies, then they'll be in grave danger. And so, sure enough, they erect gods in place of the God of Israel. So they seek after Baal and Ashtaroth, these gods who would at least promise to give them fertility and rain and protection and war. And we're told that Samuel says to them, no more. I mean, if you're lamenting God, if you really want to renew this relationship, if you really want to return then you have to rid yourself of all of these other gods. You know this language, the language of return. It's your New Testament word for repent. It's what John the Baptist cries out in the beginnings of his own ministry, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. What's beautiful about this text is that you get one very clear picture of what biblical repentance is. Samuel spells it out for us very clearly. You'll notice, first of all, what it is not. It is not simply feeling bad about your sin or about your situation. It's not even simply mourning over it. Notice the people of God are lamenting and Samuel doesn't say, well, now that you're sad about it, okay, all is well. He says there's more to be done. It's not feeling sad about all the damage you've done or the harm you've caused or the trail of bodies that lie in your wake. And while all those are very good impulses that may lead 
to true repentance? They aren't repentance. Not according to Scripture. Paul says there is a sorrow that leads to death, but it doesn't bear forth any fruit, doesn't give birth to any sort of real change concerning God. Well, why is that? Because the reality is we often feel bad about how we've acted. Sometimes we feel bad because of the consequences of our actions. Maybe you have broken up relationships. Maybe there's been bad financial ramifications in your life, or maybe there's tensions in your marriage, or you've lost your reputation a bit, and we feel bad. Sometimes we feel bad for others because of our actions, but oftentimes we feel really bad for ourselves. We're sad because we lost some things and we mourn the consequences of our actions, which again, that's not wrong in and of itself. It's just not the same thing as repentance. Because notice we are still in that action of mourning. We are the center of our sorrow. I mean, I don't want to be thought less of. I don't want to have to lose out on certain blessings. I don't want my life to change. I don't want to suffer these consequences. I don't want to hurt that person or be hurt by them. But for Samuel, feeling bad must lead to a particular twofold action that the Bible defy or what the Bible calls repentance. And so he says, if you really want to return, if you're really sorry, if you want to return, which is the first action, notice you must first turn away from these other gods. If you want to come back to Yahweh, if that's the desire you have, then you can't come back to him with tear-stained cheeks and other idols hanging out of your pockets. You have to leave these ones behind. And so you'll notice that twofold action. It's a turning away from one thing towards the God of Scripture, but turning towards him as he really is, as we will see. Our confession puts it this way, our catechism puts it this way, repentance unto life is a saving grace whereby a sinner out of a true sense of his sin and an apprehension, notice an apprehension of the mercy of Christ does with grief and hatred of his sin turn from it unto God with a full purpose of an endeavor after a new obedience. Notice repentance acknowledges the God of Scripture in totality, and as much as a man can do so. What do I mean by that? I mean, this is partly why repentance has fallen on hard times. Because <laughs> we like God as long as we, He is what we want Him to be. But biblical repentance refuses that. You know, we like to fashion God in a way that will go along with the life we've already chosen. You know, if we desire to live sexually promiscuous, then God's fine with those sorts of things. If we want, you know, to pretend that things like modesty don't exist, then, you know, God's okay with that. And if God doesn't care about what we watch or listen to, God doesn't care about how we worship, you know, God's just nice and forgiving. But that is idolatry. Because we're worshiping a God, it's just not the God of the Bible. And real repentance wants to look at God and see him for who he is and say, I want to turn to you. But when you do that, you have to acknowledge that turning to this God is turning to a God who is altogether and utterly holy. I mean, we saw that last week, so holy that you mishandle his holy things and people start dropping like flies. So holy that Sinners in one aspect don't want to have anything to do with them. I mean, how can you live and stand before a holy God? Well, Samuel's trying to tell us how. In one sense, you can't. Not if you take it seriously. The only road that leads to a God like this has to travel along the path of repentance. Repentance acknowledges that God really is who he says he is and that his commandments aren't suggestions, but they are binding altogether. You have to acknowledge that he really cares about sin as sin and doesn't just take it lightly or gently brush it under the rug. And so if you're going to come to him, you have to care too. You have to agree with his assessment of things. 
we must be willing to say holiness does matter. Obviously, it matters enough to God that he's willing to strike down those who are celebrating in one sense his return. It's acknowledging that the things that you and I have been seeking in our own way, trying to find some sort of security, some sort of meeting, we want safety, we want control, and we will conjure up all kinds of things to help us get that. We may not call them Ashtaroths and Baals, but we have all sorts of idols that we say, if I don't have this and have control over this, or if I can't find my meaning in this, then life is not worth living. And God says, you have to give all of those up and step in trust towards a God who will save. If anything I'm holding on to disagrees with God, it must be laid down and forsaken. And that's why it's so important to know what God's Word actually says. Because it's really easy to be holy as long as you don't look too closely at what God requires. Uh, if you've ever met someone that talks about holiness like they've got it together, I guarantee you they don't read carefully. I mean, that's why our confession says we should confess particular sins particularly. Well, well, why? Because it requires you to really make note of who you are. I mean, the Bible says things like, do nothing at all out of selfish ambition. That's what God requires. Consider other people better than yourself. Don't let one unwholesome word come out of your mouth, only the things that are necessary for edification. Whatever you do, from eating to drinking in every moment of your day, just do it all to the glory of God. And if you do these things, and this is just the tip of the iceberg, then you understand what holiness is. I mean, how long of a self-search does it take if those are the commandments before you realize that whatever you have decided or whatever I have decided is holiness isn't the same measure that God's using. He's using his own character and being as the measure, and this is who he is. And to stare at it in the full light of day is almost too much to take, which is exactly why Israel wanted nothing in one sense to do with it. It's not merely staying even away from the bad things. It's not leaving any good thing undone, no good word unspoken. No opportunity for mercy passed by. I mean, who can stand before a holy God? So repentance must acknowledge that what God says about sin is true. Why would you repent if you don't think you did anything wrong? And the only one who gets the standard isn't you and your imagination or the culture or what your mom thinks about you. It's what God says about you. And when we look at the law, we realize we are undone. And so it's acknowledging that God's opinion is the only one that matters, and we agree with it and also agree that we're in the wrong, that we have failed. But also at the same time, doesn't just acknowledge, notice the holiness of God. That's what's beautiful about repentance is that we don't have to ignore that God really is this holy. It also acknowledges at the same time, even according to our own catechism, that this God is merciful. I mean, why would you possibly repent if you don't think you're going to get mercy from the one that you're going to? I mean, how often does that keep us in interpersonal relationships from taking the first step and doing the right thing because we already predict the future? I know how this person is going to respond. But notice, in order to repent, you must believe that the one to whom you are coming is kind and merciful and ready to do good to those who plead to him. I mean, this is the kind of God who's willing to show grace to any sinner who comes. So biblical repentance, you'll notice, at its core, holds the tension of God's holiness and kindness together in ways that we often cannot, which is why if this particular teaching of Scripture, which is uh, profuse, gets put away as it has culturally, we end up either making God less holy in our minds so that we're okay, 
or God just becomes so distant that we would never possibly approach him and we'll just keep him at arm's length. Notice what the psalmist says, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Who could stand before holy God? The psalmist says, no one. Unless and because, but there is forgiveness with you. You're also that kind of God. You're not just a holy God. You're a God who forgives those who turn to him in faith. I mean, this is how we all came to Jesus, wasn't it? Somehow, by the mercy and the Spirit of God, we looked and we saw that we needed mercy, that we were in the wrong. But we also believed that the God of the cross was kind to sinners, and so we came to Him confessing our sin, and we were converted, or as Paul puts it, we turned to God from idols. I mean, right, we were converted. But what we learn from Scripture is that this isn't just how we start the Christian life. This is the Christian life. Over and over and over again. Conversion isn't a one-time experience. It is a lifelong reality where we come to God time and again, repenting and believing. It should be the warp and woof and the very shape of our life. And even on this Reformation Sunday, we do well to remember that first of the 95 Theses, that when Luther wrote, he said, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, notice, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. And why? Well, because as we learned a couple weeks ago, if our heart really is a perpetual factory of idols, if we're always making new things to trust and to love and to seek control through, then we must also constantly be setting those things down and returning to God, acknowledging day by day, I put my trust in this and not in you and setting it again aside. And unfortunately, we are very prone to pick these things right back up and to put our hope in them instead of in God. And so what do we do? Christ willed that our life be one of repentance. We come day in and day out repenting of our continual idolatry and turning anew to Christ. We come to God trusting He will be merciful even yet again to sinners who come to Him. I mean, repentance is a move from self and trusting that we can manage our own life and turning to God and trusting Him with the whole thing. And so every time you pick back the reins, you can know that whether you can name it or not, you are sinning. <laughs> that your life is to be entrusted to Him, that your primary confession is that you are not your own, but you belong to your faithful Savior. Calvin says, what are the fruits of repentance? In book three, he says, least one is that we may better understand our weaknesses. I think a lot of times we look at repentance and say, well, we do that and then we move on to strength. And Calvin says, if you take the law and repentance seriously, you know what you're going to learn? You're weaker than you thought. Which means you need a God bigger than you thought. And the ones you are creating just will not do. And so we have turning to God in repentance. And then you'll notice we see this repentance tested in the following verses, five and following. Israel heeds Samuel. They do as they're instructed. And as Samuel calls them together and he begins to intercede for them, and they pour out this uh, uh, libation uh, offering and they make a sacrifice. And, you know, you hear just as I am playing in the background and everyone's, you know, uh, really turning their lives around and the credits roll on the film and they all live happily ever after. And that's what we want. We, we want when we finally say, okay, Lord, I'm taking this seriously now and I repent, then hopefully God will make our lives a little kinder and easier to deal with. But while they're doing this, the Philistines see it, and they either see a threat, like, why are these guys all gathered on this mountain? Is this a war that's about to start? Or they see an opportunity. 
they're all in one place. This seems like a good time to attack our enemies. Either way, it says they mount up their armies and they proceed to bring this attack against the nation. I mean, just as they're getting their lives right with God, you know, wouldn't you go figure? We're about to see, as this text unfolds, really is pressing the question, is this repentance genuine? Have they seen who they are and who God is? I mean, what got us in this horrible mess to begin with? We've been traveling after the ark for weeks now. And what got us into that situation is that the Philistines mounted for war and the Israelites and all of their wisdom and self-confidence said, hey, grab the ark. If God goes with us, we can't lose. We have God on our side. And they take the ark out in all of their pride uh, and in all lack of fear. And God says, you know, I'm not a trinket to be toyed with. I'm not your good luck charm. And they get routed horribly. And you'll notice the ark goes into exile. No prayer, no prophet, no respect for God, just an assumption that God had to work for them on their terms. But now, I mean, look at the beauty of this. I mean, the fruit that's coming in this form of repentance, you'll notice no confidence in themselves at all. It says they are very afraid. And the only request they make to Samuel is, don't stop praying for us. Which means we know we can't do anything. You've got to call out to God on our behalf. He's our only hope. He is our total confidence. They went from having this confidence that God had to work on their terms to casting themselves on the mercy of God and trusting that if they were going to have any sort of hope for victory, it would have to be God and God alone to save. I mean, even as the Philistines approach, if you look at the language carefully, we don't hear of Israel even making plans for war, all we see is Samuel continuing to offer sacrifices. I mean, this is starting to remind us of, of Israel of old, walking around cities and, you know, singing songs and blowing trumpets and winning. Uh, you know, this is the kind of thing that you don't do if you're about to get attacked. It's just like, well, just keep killing the cows. We'll see what happens here next. But they have given up. All they have at this point is a lamb and a prayer. I mean, what a difference from that first encounter. When in pride, they thought they could manipulate God. Now in humility, they only seek his mercy in repentance and faith. I mean, this is, people of God, listen to me, this is where their strength lies, in remaining helpless and dependent. Their weakness was when they were confident and thought they were strong, and their strength is here when they say, we know us, and we know we can't win. We have to put our hope in God. And this is why God is pleased to show us, brothers and sisters, week in and week out, that we are still in great need. I mean, if you can handle the language, I mean, this is the glory of repentance. It's an acknowledgement of need that comes with an empty hand of faith, saying, we have nothing. Whatever we have is going to have to come from your hand. You must fill us. But when we are confident, that is our death. When we are dependent, according to Scripture, we are safe because we rest in the one who is our refuge. As one author writes, as stern as John the Baptist's words and presence may have been, his call to repentance is not a demand to just clean up your act and be all you can be. It is an invitation to confess not just our failures, but our need for God and for his mercy. It's an invitation to say what is perhaps one of the very hardest things for us to say. I need help. I have nothing to offer. And so if that is where we see at least uh, the fruits and the testing of their repentance, I want us to see running to the repentant as we close. As we learn, as soon as Saul, Samuel turns for them to God... It tells us God is answering and thundering on their behalf. Uh, I mean, do you see what, what's going on here? Because you need to see it. 
They put God on the shelf for 20 years. And that was just the tail end of some very bad things that got them in this situation. I mean, they threatened to treat him like a good luck charm, which led to his humiliation and his exile. But notice what the text says. As soon as they turn to God, God runs to them. I mean, he doesn't stand back with folded arms saying, you know, he'll believe them once they prove themselves over time. He doesn't say, yes, you're forgiven, but, you know, the trust has been broken and it's going to be a bit before I can give myself wholly to you. He doesn't require a pound of flesh for all of his troubles and his waiting. They call and he runs to them thundering on the way. Do you believe that? Do you believe that when you turn to God from your sin, that God really delights to forgive you? That he comes running? Unabashedly, unashamedly so. I mean, God, you'll notice, tells his own story. He tells us what we are to think of him. You don't do him any service by making him more proper than he is. And when he tells the preeminent story about God's saving love, the prodigal son, when we think of it, we often imagine you know, the prodigal as the most extravagant one in the tale. You know, he spent all his money on wine and women and song. He blew the inheritance. He humiliated the family. But if you think that, you miss the most glorious but disturbing point of the parable altogether, that there is one character within it that is far more excessive in his actions than the prodigal son. I mean, this father is pictured with his eyes ever on the horizon, waiting and watching and hoping that his son will return. And it tells us when he was still a long way off. I mean, how do you see him when he's that far away unless you're waiting there, wanting him to return? And he says, as soon as he sees him, he sets off into a sprint with not one care about what the neighbors will think. And his son, who you'll notice came home because he knew the character of his father. Even his servants are treated better than this. He can't even get out a proper apology that he's been rehearsing the whole time of his travels. You know, this callous, fleshly, squandering younger son looks tame when compared to the shameless and lavish display of the love of his father. I mean, this running and hugging and kissing and money spending and jewelry gifting, calf killing, party throwing, apology ignoring father far outstrips the son in what we would consider bad behavior. And God says, I want you to look at me like this. That any sinner who turns to me, I won't make them come the long way home. I will run to get them. A God who no matter how long you've mistreated him, ignored him, or shamed him, or blamed him, at the very moment of your turning, there he is with arms wide open, ready to welcome you home. And people of God, it's being assured of that very kindness that should lead you to repentance. I mean, why should you return? Because this is the God that you serve. Yes, holy. Far holier than we even can imagine. But far more gracious than you can wrap your mind around. So what are you waiting for? Are you waiting to get better? It could be a while, uh, given our track record. Are you waiting to feel worthy? I mean, if you are, you miss the point completely in doing so. Are you waiting to see if your next plan finally works, the next scheme you've had to find what it is you're looking for? All your self-fashioned idols are worthless and will be proven so time and time again. Return, repent, and know that without a doubt, God is right there, ready to rejoice over you. 
And this is the rock by which we stand. Who can stand before a holy God? Those who come to him based on the mercy displayed in the broken body and shed blood of his son. We have a lamb and a prayer. That's all we have. We have a lamb that was, shed, that, that was given for us who ever intercedes on our behalf. And as this text closes, you'll notice they raise this Ebenezer stone, the stone of help. We sing about it all the time. Maybe you didn't know what it meant. <laughs> and they confess this. Up till now, up to this point, when we look back on the whole of our life, it was always God who's been our help. We have no other trust, no other confidence, no other salvation but God. And we have that as well, week after week, in broken body and shed blood, in bread and in wine. We can say every week, thus far the Lord has helped us. He did what we could not do. He saved those that could not save themselves. And he's ready to forgive sinners who come to him, whether this is the millionth time or the first time. And he will rush to do so. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray.